Fulkari is the vibrant textile art of Punjab, as we all know it, and it continues to be extolled even today in poetry and song. This poem by the Punjabi poetess Amrita Pritam uses an unfinished Fulkari as a metaphor for life and living, love and yearning for the absent lover, a popular theme. <coughs> This is a picture of my, my photograph of my unfinished piece, which I find to be very evocative. It provokes reflection and I often wonder what its narrative would be. Did the passage of time leave its mark on the embroiderer? Did she have to abandon it in the flight to safety and security? What stories would this unfinished piece narrate, if only it could? It is hanging amongst the other pieces in the hall. Pulkari was the women's domain, an inner courtyard activity, thringen in Punjabi, which included spinning and churning butter alongside baby care and food preparation. Pulkari translates as flower work and its canvas homespun khadi is visible through the embroidery. The more, the more elaborate bag covers the fabric almost completely and its origin may lie in the hands of very accomplished embroiderers of Pulkari as proof of high skill. While East Punjab is known, for the, is known more for the Pulkari, it is West Punjab with its renown for high art, which is credited with the Bagh. Very fine, intricate work on Khadi, which was softer and finer. While a pul Pulkari would invariably be embroidered with butt or untwisted silk thread of vivid colors, orange, lime, green, Indian pink plus white, which was usually in cotton thread, a Bagh would usually be restricted to two, and most often to yellow and white, representing gold and silver, Sona Chandi. Magenta and green is another combination seen on white khadi and is said to have been worn by older women. Two names are given to these, Thirma or Salu. Then there is, there is the Pachrangi, Satrangi, Norangi as well. The Pachrangi is five color, the seven color is a Satrangi and Norangi is a nine color. The chop is also considered to be a pulkari, although its embroidery st stitches are very different. In Sanchi, the pictorial chadar, also part of the pulkari gamut, there are recurring th themes. The train, for example, a woman spinning on a charkha or churning butter. Uh, there are instances of the engraves being de depicted too, as well as wrestlers, the story of Shravan Kumar we in India are so familiar with. These are fascinating insights into the world view of the embroiderers and of life around them. The motives seem to form an oral database. They are repeated so often on centuries I have seen. They are passed down through stories and myths recounted, preserved for posterity on these embroidered works. The Sanchi itself seems to be based on the Sanji that women make on the walls of their homes during the Navratra season. The Varida Bagh was traditionally offered to a bride on a wedding by her new in-laws. And the work from the Swat Valley, now in Pakistan, is also very fine and beautiful. The fabric lighter, but darker in color than most we see. A lot of them are done on black. And uh, here, what we have been doing, the girls are unable to embroider on black. They need to count the threads and it is very difficult. The late Mr. S.S. Hit Hitkari has left for posterity his passion for Pulkari in his book, Pulkari, the Folk Art of Punjab. It includes his collection of magnificent old works, the entire gamut as it were. Ornamental Pulkari, Meenakari Bags, figurative Sanchi to agricultural motives. The range is vast. Unfortunately, very little is known about the uh, provenance of Pulkari embroidery. For every story one's here, there is an opposite one told as well. Did it come to Punjab as a transfer of technology through invasions and settlers or travel and trade over centuries past? Or was it an indigenous textile art? We can only speculate. But this lack of information is in itself seductive. It allows one to entertain different possibilities. And this thought has come to me because I was looking at a lot of these works. And since I've been working with the crafts for many years, is it possible that Pulkari embroidery evolved from the weaving craft? I, you know, this is the Pulkari motive that we do. 
but it resembles the Rudraksh so much. And if you see the Rudraksh, uh, the, the warp of the Rudraksh, I have a very small piece here. Unfortunately, I couldn't take a photograph. I've taken a photograph, but I couldn't put it on the PowerPoint for some reason. When you see the vertical lines, it makes you think that maybe it, there's a possibility that uh, there's uh, a link there. But it's not an idea which I've developed uh, well. It's just a thought that I'm sharing with you for now. Um, the medallion, this is another handwoven piece. This is from a Banarsi dupatta. And this is a Pulkari which is on display here. The mathematical precision and geometry of the basic motives which best identify the Pulkari and Bagh parallel those of handwoven motives in carpets and textiles. In weaving, it is a Nakshpaz who literally maps out the designs to be woven. And in, and in embroideries like Pulkari, women without formal training map out their designs directly onto the grid-like weave of the fabric, using just a straight stitch to delineate the margins of the chosen motives. I thought of using graph paper, a mock te textile as it were, making the most basic Pulkari motive on it. The emotives emerged quite clearly, and that was a reference point from where I began to think about it being based on the weaving craft. <clears throat> they talk about uh, native intelligence, and uh, I feel that maybe it is the native intelligence of these women of Punjab that allows them to see designs in the fabric itself. They work in tandem with the fabric, not needing to trace out or print the design onto it. I also offer that the medallions are the motives central to Pulkari embroidery and the others were added later to the repertoire, sometimes from the geometry that surrounds our daily lives. Yes, yeah, so this is just a second. Something like this. The ingenuity of the embroiderer takes over as she masters the craft. The flower a bloom is halved, and to it is added a stem and leaves. Another embroidery stitch, and it becomes a, an ornament. Two flowers, three fourths in size, combine into a bouquet with long stems. A row completes a pallu. An independent quarter motive can be repeated, or other embroidery stitches added to redefine it. This can be further halved. The full motive can be more curvy linear or more geometric in shape. The possibilities may not be infinite, but there are many nevertheless. Monotony, it certainly is not. The same ingenuity is on display again when what we call the kite motive is halved and lo and behold, a peacock emerges. The history of handwork textiles is replete with such stories, but we know that decorative pieces were made for ceremonies marking the rites of passage for special usage. In an aside, handwork then has always been invested with social and cultural significance. It is also interesting to note that the skill may have gone unremarked, <coughs> women's work after all, but the finished product itself was highly cherished. In Naba's village, villages, I have only once seen a few Pulkari chadars emerging from a woman's sanduk to be passed on to her daughters. More often, women were willing to talk of their collection of bridal dharis. Pulkari was the woman's domain, an inner courtyard uh, activity, thrinjan in uh, Punjabi, which included spinning and churning butter alongside baby care and food preparation as women sat and bonded together. At the same time, it was not uncommon to outsource the work, as F.A. Steele mentions in her article written in 1888. Wife of an ICS officer, she was known to be a prolific writer and a keen and empathetic observer of life and customs in rural India. She writes, and I'm just going to take a, uh, a short quote from her. Here it is, a work of leisure, the work of women who after doing yeoman service with father or husband in the fields, sit the heaps of golden grain, darn away with patient, clumsy fingers at the roll of ruddy cloth upon their lap. Let's reflect on that work, leisure. I will try to recreate a day in the life of a Punjabi village woman, as I have observed it, to help you visualize it for yourself. 
Her morning chores include washing, feeding and milking the cattle, making tea and meals for the family which usually includes one or both parents-in-law, husband and children, sending off her husband to the fields if that's his work with a midday meal and the children to school, washing clothes, cleaning the house. She then sits down her leisure time to embroider. If she's lucky, she gets to work uninterrupted for an hour or so before the unexpected neighbor drops in for chai and chat or it's time for the children to come home for, uh, from school. On my first visit in 2007, I was armed with a lot of knowledge, but the ground reality proved to be very different. The Naba Foundation was very keen to start an income generation program in Pulkari embroidery for the women of Naba's villages as one of its many initiatives. Naba is a tehsil of Patiala district and comprises of 174 villages as well as the town of Naba. It is predominantly a rural and agricultural population. <clears throat> the Patiala Naba road is lined with agricultural fields on both sides and signs of the two main crops wheat and rice and their attendant activities are visible throughout the year. I am showing you a few uh, photographs of sites that we see on that road. In the spring, some fields may be abloom with flowers for export and Naba's men are enterprising. There are factories manufacturing uh, combined harvesters, huge furniture showrooms, carpenters, emu farming and dairy farming as well. This is a potter on that road. Many of the women who live in Naba's villages usually participate in the various activities linked to agriculture. Not only they, do they benefit from the Narega established pay scale, they especially enjoy the social bonding with other women, despite the hard labor these activities on the field entail. In the initial phase of the project, this proved to be somewhat of an obstacle. Not only were they getting paid for the work, but I suspect they were happy to escape for a day, the drudgery of home and housework which compensated for the hard labor. So we met with women in those early days who expressed their willingness to learn the Pulkari embroidery and be a part of the program, either to immediately start on production because they were already skilled or to learn it. However, it soon became apparent that their skill was very basic, far removed from the workmanship we associate with Pulkari and bag work. Those who claimed to do the embroidery could only do it following the traced or hand-blocked pattern on cotton or a synthetic uh, Georgette. It is a known fact that not only was Pulkari being done without tracing or printing in the old days, it was also done from the reverse side of Khaddar. So while I was very excited at the prospect of working with this craft of Punjab, but given my passion for all things traditional, I knew I could only do it if the Naba Foundation accepted my proposal to revive the old way of doing the embroidery. Fortunately, they did, and we commenced on our journey together in the first quarter of 2008. Here, I must single out Maria Angelica Vargas, who was heading uh, the foundation at that time. She did not come from a crafts background, but she was convinced by my focus on traditional skills. We owe a lot to her for this craft revival and a belief that we could make it happen together. In those early days, it soon seemed that I had embarked on Mission Impossible. I wanted to revive the traditional Pulkari embroidery, but where was the essential component to do so? We required an embroiderer who was skilled in this old way. I had brought in as a designer of products with Pulkari pro embroidery, which presumed the existence of the skill. When I joined, it was virtually a startup, and within a few months, for lack of funds, the project was temporarily closed. When it reopened, we had to start anew to cajole the women to return to the training sessions and, of course, to persevere. For example, in one village, women were willing to start the training at 10 a.m. Excuses were rampant, no shows, always higher than members present. And despite their self-professed enthusiasm to learn, it was soon apparent their minds were elsewhere. They were marking time. The hearth was ready to be lit. The next meal was being mentally prepared. The story in the second village would be no different. As a result, training pre periods were brief, truncated on demand, and in between any training sessions, the women were not practicing, so progress was not dis were just non-existent. Those first visits were very difficult, ponderous even. Initially, we started the training in two of Naba's villages. The first meetings saw the numbers of enthusiastic women wanting to par participate swell. But once the training started, the numbers dwindled for any number of reasons. Sewing, 
harvesting, children, family, eye strain, medical reasons, etc. The attrition rate was high. Amongst the women, there was one who was skilled enough to train the others, but in the commercial pulkari work that has flooded the market over the years. This is one of the, um, actually it's not the early, early days, but this is when we started the training after we figured out how to do it. And But you can see the, what you've seen in the uh, hall, and you can see how clumsy it is even in the first few days of uh, the training. So the work they did in the beginning was so clumsy my heart would sing. It became obvious with every passing day that we were not going to make much progress. Consequently, even though I knew the darn stitch of Pulkari embroidery was done by counting the threads of Khadr, I got wooden blocks and paper templates made of Pulkari motifs to print or trace on fabrics. The work improved but slightly. During one of my trips, I visited the museum in Chandigarh where I met someone who remarked that the embroiderer was, would cease to see the fabric and just follow the printed or traced design. Here it was then, the symbiotic relationship between the embroidery and the fabric. Since Pulkari work is done by counting threads, I understood what she meant, that this change of focus would lead to, would lead to an unevenness in the embroidered motives. It was a thought-provoking observation at the time to me, and it set me thinking and dreaming once again of the traditional skill. I would visualize a lucky day when we would meet a woman who knew how to do the work in the traditional way and as an added bonus from the reverse side of the fabric. They say if you dwell upon something ardently, the unique universe conspires to make it happen. And one day it did. This is a contemporary tringen as I call it. <laughs> this is our practice session. Out of the blue as we were sitting, practicing, talking, a little old lady climbed up the stairs and entered the room. She joined us and claimed to have done a lot of pulkari work in her younger days. I requested her to show us and she did despite her tired old eyes. She did the embroidery, albeit a small motif on the reverse side and showed it to us. Fortunately, my camera was on hand that day. Just a short clip. But as I reflect on that episode of our journey, I think it may have been the turning point because with the next training of a new group, there was a qualitative difference in their workmanship for one, but also in the way the embroidery was being done. The women were counting the threads and not following a printed or traced outline any longer. And very importantly, they were doing the embroidery with understanding. And this facilitated spreading the skill to more women. In the absence of education and writing skills, embroidery became the distinctive handwriting and the art of storytelling. This is in the past, of course. Today, they uh, do learn how to uh, write and to read, of course. One young women's stitches are long and uniform, another shorter by half, both equally neat and beautiful. Neither one of them finds it possible to shorten or lengthen her stitches. Isn't that what handwriting is all about? For example, we have also had a young trainee who was very anxious to learn the skill and to be a part of the group in one of the villages. However, she was finding it very difficult to learn. And during a training session in my presence, she burst into tears and I suggested she be taught the methodology, methodology using very long stitches if necessary. It worked, she made progress, but she was soon married and left for her new home. And this is what we're seeing constantly. I have learned through working on the uh, Pulkari training that imprints can come from any personal first-hand experience to be taken to something totally different. So from yoga came the insight of the subtle beauty of space itself. Because when they were doing the embroidery, I used to tell them that the space between the lines of the motif should be beautiful. And once that was beautiful, the motif itself would be very beautiful. From the movie Tare Zameen Pe, the inspiration to teach one young girl embroidery using long stitches. From graph paper as a mock piece of fabric, the thought of this embroidery's origin, origins in weaving. So even now in this project, there are lots of issues that crop up. The unmarried girls get married and move on. There are families to be dealt with, dealt with mothers-in-law and children to be taken care of. 
But at the same time, we are seeing heartening change as well. Young women have started earning and are either contributing to the family income or taking classes and paying for them independently. The stories are different from family to family, from one village to another. In recent conversations with some of the embroiderers, there are women who have there are women in the family, older women, who have been working in government jobs, and that makes the others more ambitious and more aspirational too. The workmanship of these women today in Naba has improved immensely, but we are still at a nation stage. We continue to add to our repertoire of motives. The motives of the bag are proving to be more complicated to embroider, but we are trying to get there and hope to reproduce old samples of both bag and pulkari. We have one girl has managed to reproduce uh, one of the medallion motives, and it's been put up, uh, it's been framed and put up on display. <clears throat> there were other things which uh, came in. You know, fabric uh, proved to be has proved to be very difficult uh, difficult uh, to source. We have used uh, khadar, of course, and here's a photograph. This is the khadar today is very different from what it was in the earlier days, and it really doesn't look like this piece which I've hung up over here. It's finer. The colors are just uh, different, if I can put it that way. But we have been using successfully coat part from Orissa and uh, yeah, and malka. And the the patta I'm wearing is on malka fabric. It's a very fine fabric, and it's quite amazing how the women are able to count the threads of this fabric. <clears throat> the threads are also different. In the early days, threads used to be dyed, but we don't have any dyers in uh, Naba who know how to uh, dye threads with the sticks. So this is the jumble that we got, unusable. So this is what we use now, spools of thread. If anybody has solutions for us, they're more than welcome. So we actually went, because of the limitation, we went directly to the manufacturer, manufacturer, but he was he was willing to help, but only with large quantities of threads. So that's a wonderful option if you have large orders, but when you want to create uh, uh, new samples, it becomes very difficult. So we've really had to make uh, things according to what is available. So in itself, a big problem also. I'd like to thank the Naba Foundation and its promoters, Mrs. Jeet Kemka and her family, who have very, very generously supported and sustained this program from the outset. The women have received training free of cost and all the necessary material, fabric, frames, needles, thread, threads have been provided gratis to them. The embroiderers are now a part of a self-help group under the name of Seva Mahila Pulkari Nabha and they have participated successfully in some of Delhi's main crafts bazaars <clears throat> and have completed several orders for two of India's main retail chains. One of her younger trainees was awarded the Kamla Devi Puraskar for 2013 by the Delhi Crafts Council. So the response by those involved in the world of Indian crafts has been very enthusiastic at the revival of this traditional craft. And I would thank Lela Tiyabji who is here. Similarly, Punjabi women have responded war warmly to the skill they have seen. Some tell me that a Pulkari is considered to be a good omen and passed down from generation to generation as one. Interestingly, in the early stages, when I mentioned we would be creating products, I met with protest. Kulkari was always meant to be worn as a dupatta and not as products, not as bags or cushion covers or etc. The resonance is both at the cultural and social level. A lot of songs even today refer to Pulkari. Popular, like, yeah. In conversations with different women within the circle of family and friends, a picture seems to be emerging, but as yet the sample survey is too small. However, as of now, it appears that upper middle class Hindu women may have outsourced pulkari work, perhaps to Muslim women. One person I spoke to now in her mid-80s remembers the older women in the family giving work to women who used to come home to help with daily household chores. And it seems these 
Same upper middle class Hindu women as young girls were taught embroidery but the European embroidered stitches, probably considered to be more sophisticated at the time. Folkloric embroidery was not their calling. On the other hand, Sikh women narrate stories about their chadars having been embroidered by grandmothers, mothers and even aunts. In their families, bags and or pulkaris have been passed down the generations venerated as a good omen and they find a sacred space in religious or marriage ceremonies as a canopy over the bride or to be used to drape over the holy book or as a cover on a divan or charpoy to welcome an honored guest atiti devo bhava my mother also in her 80s recalls pulkari and bags in her mother's collection but most probably they got left behind in the flight to security and safety at the time of partition But you know, a lot of people, even when they came over here, they were being used as covers. I found a photograph of myself as a teenager, standing in front of a divan, which is beautifully covered with a with a nice pulkari. She remembers clearly her mother spinning on a charkha, but has no recollection of pulkari embroidery being done by any family member. The times, yes, they have changed. We love any imperfections that may exist in old pieces, but our eyes today demand perfection in the newly made. Each most motive has to be of a specific size and equal one to another. Spacing between motives must be regular. The fabric must not have weaving defect, defect so called, and thread colors must be uniform. The same nazar booty is said to have been incorporated into the chadar by the embroiderer to ward off re- evil. Other so called imperfections were most certainly need based, linked to financial circumstances or miscalculation of thread required for the size of cloth on hand. So if the thread color finished it had to be redyed and the two colors could have been close but not exactly the same <clears throat> Professor Harjit Singh Gill has written a book a pulkari in Bhatinda I spoke to him and he explained his book was not about pulkari as a craft instead as a professor of semiotics he offers a semiotic discourse on pulkari its signs and symbols are seen on the pieces he has chosen as references He refers to the semiological universe of the craftswomen, introducing his academic imprint on the subject. So again, you can take an imprint from anywhere and bring it to Pulkari, for example. In the early days, I would tell the trainees to firstly train their eyes to recognize either a mistake or fine work. With embroidery stitches of the same length, was a space even between the stitches and the lines as well, and to explain to them the aesthetics of this space as well. these concepts were so new to all of them as i reflect on it today the journey began with a meeting of two different minds the foundation and its goal to start an income generation and women's empowerment program and mind the purest envisioning the glory of the past and so the two merged and thus a revival was born it's been such a rewarding experience for me as a punjabi to uh, work to revive the craft of the state and of course of india However for the craft to be sustained it is imperative to widen the scope and to impart the skill to more women and i hope that this will be this, this is what we will see in time to come thank you so much everybody for coming i should have done that in the beginning sorry i just forgot thank you very very much and i hope you'll take a good look at the uh, pulkari pieces on display the new ones of course have been done by the women of the foundation and the old pieces are all my personal collection <laughs> thank you very questions yes yeah um, so like now, you know usually you talk about the background right. of the kind of one yeah so so lovely colors like the one you have yeah do you not dye the piece of cloth but this is not khadi this is this is not khadar at all this yes. is the malkha yes. this is malkha but are you not able to find the corresponding khadar it's not the same quality and you can see you know it, i i don't know if even if you were to find it would it be the same uh, would it take the colors because it's a very coarse uh, coarse fabric and uh, the colors that you see originally are browns grayish browns some reds like this of course but um, the khadi that we're seeing today the colored khadi that we see at kvc that's <laughs> it's quite sad <laughs> it's not the we have one piece i think we have one piece but there's just something about the fabric which is not very very nice and uh, you know the these threads for instance surely you can get threads like that yeah yeah no no we've been getting these threads no, these are the threads we use now yeah yeah 
हाँ दीज आर द्रेड दैट वी यूज नाउ वी डोंट हैव अ चॉइस सम पीपल वुड लाइक अस टू यूज नेचुरल कलर्ड वन बट वी हैव सक्सीडेड इन गेटिंग दैम डाइड There's a very big tradition of embroidery, beautiful embroidery, also done by women, also with a home, uh, um, you know, the the cloths that you, that they embroider is also woven by them you know, on their chakras and things like that. Lela, would you like to say something about that? Well, I was actually wondering whether, uh, you know, when uh, when we started working in Kutch with. both the rabaris and particularly mm-hmm. with the souf women mm-hmm. when souf is also a counter thread embroidery and we had the same problem that on the market we just couldn't find the thing but now the weavers in bujori are making and they make it for color raksha or mm-hmm. and for kasab and all these groups a kind of loosely woven hand spun hand woven material it seems to work very well and which you can dye also so maybe that's a place that you could source i think this loosely woven uh, fabric has not been working too well for this work hmm. you know the there because there's something about the khadi and also i'm really we're fortunate that it works so well over here it just sort of snuggle the thread snuggle into hmm. the fabric as it were you know yeah Yeah, and this is not because they're very loose threads in some of the fabrics that we've tried the loose uh, yeah. woven ones well it uh, i think you should have a look at that because we had exactly the same problem with the souf embroidery but yeah. now it's mm-hmm. working very well mm-hmm. so, so thank you this fabric called this is malkha this malkha. is malkha yeah and it's a combination of malmal and khadi so they've coined a word and uh, so it's being done in andhra pradesh But what about the old pulkaris? They were done on khadar. Mm-hmm. Hand span. Yeah, Reena. I just want to tell you that the khadar of the Punjab is totally different. Totally, totally. Yeah, it looks. It looks. Yes. It looks It's totally different. It's done in a completely different way, and the thread is different. You know. So that is why the pulkari has this particular. Yeah, it is uh, very different, yeah. and that is why it takes this osha color. May- so maybe well. the, the maybe the cotton is different. It maybe is, the, yes. the charkha and, is different. Yeah, charkha and the um, you know the weaving process because the weaving process? like the case, the famous Punjabi case, you know that it comes from your mothers in my hometown. Yeah, Chang, they made the case. Yeah. This is a different way of weaving. so you cannot this cloth will be very difficult to replicate and the other thing i wanted to tell you was you said your mother said uh, that you know there was no pulkari you see the west punjabis khatri west punjabis we did not have a tradition of pulkaris but they had so it in their house this is more a sikh thing and uh, sikh it's really sikh and because it's related to the darbar sahib and to a custom they have called chadar pauna which is for the marriage of the widow with the devar that was uh, there was no sort of religious ceremony they used to put the phulkari over that couple and then say the ardas so uh, it's a very much a sick thing and that's why it's found in what they call the phulkia states of east punjab phulkia states but in uh, certain areas of west punjab it was prevalent like in gujarat not gujarat this rashtra gujarat punjab okay and in parts of jhelum district mm. okay as we are talking about khadar it's uh, to me this is fascinating the because there are women in uh, punjab who are still spinning on charkhas so if somebody has a project in mind please think about it <laughs> there and there are older women so i feel that we are always talking about skill development for younger people but here are these older women who know how to uh, spin they they'd be quite willing to spin so we can find a market for the product let's think about it if anyone's interested i have a question please sunil yes sure. uh, i've asked this uh, a similar question in another forum in in this excavation of india's textile pride and the legacy that we are relooking at we often talk about skills commerce reemployment employment 
what is the regeneration of emotion amongst the women that you work with we seem to be taking pride in our skills rural skills are women also taking pride are they feeling emotional about it what's going on in their minds in their sense of self pride and so forth i think it's a commercial activity for them so i'm not sure uh, about the emotional aspect right now i'm they were not even aware of uh, phulkari embroidery you know being able to do it but they see today is very very different so is there an emotion i'm not sure about that at all not at all really for them it's uh, they are happy to do it they are earning they are able to do certain things with the money they earn and for now i would say that is enough for them but you know it's a it's a thought we should maybe we should talk to them about that angle as well the historic angle the you see it's a, sto- a story it's after all a story yeah Yeah. The secret jewel, the shadi, yeah. the chadar. You know what Reena is telling us today. Yeah, even I don't know. There's some emotion somewhere. Because even in this book uh, that Mr. Gill has written, I mentioned that book. He talks about this chadar pauna, but uh, this woman has already been uh, at a different wedding, an earlier uh, marriage. The woman has already been given a pulkari <coughs> from both her father, uh, from her parents' side, and from her in-laws' side. So. if it's given only at the time of this chadar pauna as you're talking about used, used. Yes. but it was also being gifted it was also being gifted as a mm. i think we've lost a lot of these uh, traditions it was also used for this yeah. because you know they didn't have the ceremony again you know yeah okay okay i see they didn't have the ceremony again yeah huh. I would really, Shivali. I don't think I would be able to answer that question. Um, all I've seen is, I don't think they talk. Up, they know about the emotional aspect of it. I mean, it's not as though we've gone to any gurdwaras and seen it. You know, they don't have any pulkaris. So, no, no old But ones. They are gainfully employed. That itself is an issue. Yeah. It must be contributing to a sense of self. Perhaps it's not documented that way, but. Uh, you know, as a skill yes they are very proud to be able to do it and they're doing very fine work and plus they cannot uh, embroider now on a uh, fabric which is traced or printed they know they're curious that a whole lot of urban societies and triumphant ngos and workers and some veterans we are all learning to take a deep sense of pride in who we are as indians partly because of our textile legacy but what is happening on the other side of people who create who create and sustain this that's legacy that's true that's an interesting quick question actually yeah sorry i think this is too new for them right now you know we just started yeah yeah they've just started uh, doing this work in the last few years you know the project may have started 7 uh, years ago but they they themselves the girls who are presently working maybe it's been 3 years you know so early days still But I think it's an interesting point, and we should talk about it. So thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, ma'am, you had mentioned that uh, you spoke to a lot of girls, but they were they were not interested in. So, did you uh, get deep in it and uh, ask them? well the thing was that the foundation wanted to uh, start this uh, income generation and women's empowerment program so they were adamant to get women involved you know so that really helped so it was the foundation who was uh, the people from the foundation were going and finding the girls older women whoever was interested so slowly slowly they were able to build but the uh, enthusiasm really built up when uh, some of the girls started earning money of course but then do you think you do you need to have a you know training session and let them open up to them uh, a training session for open up to them i mean because they are the new generation they don't understand the, the significance of the culture which is growing within them and the heritage which is coming from their family so but that's what i'm saying you know they don't have uh, they don't have pulkaris in their uh, homes they don't have the old pulkaris there's no significant the only time i saw some pulkaris was a woman's uh, brother was selling them 
you know and he was a collector and not a collector he was a trades person you know so they they're very like i said i just met one person who had any sort of collection you know so we can we can try this is a very interesting point that shafari has brought out and we could include it but i think all around right now it's all about helping these women um earn money you know and be self sufficient okay okay thank you thank you all thank for coming